This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is Twim, This Week in Microbiology, episode number 248, recorded on August 5th, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Michigan, Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello. Great to be with you. From Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. From Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Well, hello there. And we have a guest today returning from the great Northwest, Mark Martin. Welcome back. I'm I'm really happy to be here, and we've got some really good measurements for CO2 here in the lab. <laughs> He's got a CO2 measure. That's very good. Uh, Mark is in Puget Sound, right? University of Puget Sound in lovely Tacoma, Washington. Tacoma, Washington. Okay. There's no town named Puget Sound, right? No. He would be <laughs> in a boat floating on water if he was in Puget Sound. I would. So, uh, have you got cloudy skies today, or is it sunny? Here? Yeah, oh, yeah. We, we always tell people that it's cloudy and rainy because that way people don't come here. Yeah, you, you want to keep people away. It's All a right. lovely day here, honestly. It really is. It's, there's a little bit of sunshine out there. Um, uh, the water looks beautiful. Uh, I live half a mile from campus, so it's quite lovely. Do you walk, Mark? I do. That's great. What a, what a, what a lucky guy you are. It's only I, what you deserve. <laughs> <laughs> Haley, you're the All greatest. Right. All right, so Mark has joined us to uh, help us talk about a paper. But before we do that, um, yeah, we have some words from Michelle about um, increasing diversity in our field. Yeah, thank you. And this was inspired by a piece written by Mark Pfeiffer, who is or Pfeiffer, I'm sorry, who's a professor at University of North Carolina in the Department of Biology, titled "Looking Back on a Life of Unacknowledged Privilege and a Call to Action." And this piece was published in March of 2021 in the um, journal Molecular Biology of the Cell, which is the premier journal of the American Society for Cell Biology. So um, Mark is quite active um, in his field. He study, uses His lab uses um, Drosophila as a experimental model to study um, how the body plan self-assembles and looks at particular um, factors that contribute and also relates that to um, cancer oncogenesis. But um, he, in this case, is in this piece really reflected on how he got to where he is and um, what he can do to provide that opportunity to a wide variety of um, people. So he tells the story that he was born on a farm in central Minnesota um, where his parents were farming turkeys, but a tornado came and wiped out the farm, which meant they had to go into the city, and his dad found work as a janitor uh, with General Motors and then working um, stocking parts. His mother got a job as a bookkeeper, but they were able to get him an excellent um, public education in Minnesota, and as he um, got older, he was able to um, get a job um, as an orderly at a nursing home during high school, and that helped um, pay for college. He went to um, St. Olaf, a small school in Minnesota, and there he um, appreciates that he had a number of excellent mentors that kind of opened some doors for him and started him on a path of, of science. And these include um, Erwin Rubinstein, who he worked with as an undergrad and then um, worked as a technician and really um, was exposed to the, to the world of um, research. So he also realizes that along the way, because he got advice from these mentors, he learned about um, particular programs that can give people a leg up and, and kind of the first step on the ladder, including a um, research experience for undergraduate positions at the University of Minnesota, funded by the um, National Science Foundation. And then um, the postdocs in the lab that he was in um, were great role models, and he ended up um, getting, a facu- uh, getting a postdoctoral position at um, Princeton with Eric Vichas, and who was a real um, leader in the field, and then um, got his faculty position at UNC. 
so he realizes that um, early on he had some advocates, some mentors in the field who, for example, he credits with getting him a position on a study section with the American Cancer Society. And he realized that made his own grants better. So it's another way where if you if you get a little advantage, it can really amplify and um, have a long-term impact. So he later um, has served on study sections for the National Institutes of Health and later was invited and recruited to serve on the Council for Center for Scientific Research. And there he became aware of the disparity in our field. Um, so not only are underrepresented minorities um, sorely underrepresented in our field, but also there's data, for example, showing that um, Black principal investigators are only 55% as likely to receive an award as a white PI, even when other um, variables are controlled for, including similar academic achievement. And furthermore, a study showed that um, many Black applicants choose to work on um, subjects that themselves are are funded at a much lower rate um, in institutes of the NIH. Um, So this is kind of a double bind um, for many of our um, Black colleagues. So his um, essay is really looking back at the at each step that he got along the way as a white male um, who who was fortunate to get excellent um, public education scholarships and mentoring along the way, and he is calling on each of us um, to do more to really address the disparities in our field. So, for example, um, he he gives practical advice like we've got to work harder to find a diverse group of speakers and presenters when we um, ha- are working on our seminar program programs or conferences. We need to nominate Black colleagues for awards for our scientific societies and also um, not leave the work of um, diversity at your institution to our underrepresented minority colleagues. So he currently is a co-PI on an NSF-funded research experience for undergraduates program, which is called SURE at UNC. Um, So this is a way he's trying to give back. And he also um, is argues that we need to really listen to our newly hired um, Black colleagues and understand better what uh, micro and macro aggressions they face and be creative about what um, mechanisms we can put in place at our institutions um, to address this um, disparity. And I'm going to include in the show notes a number of resources that our colleagues have developed. But before I do that, I'd like to just make a couple personal comments. First of all, um, I was fortunate to have Mark as a role model when I was a new um, graduate student. We were both in the genetics department at Harvard Medical School. And I remember fondly talking to him excitedly about the project I was working on. I just discovered the gene I was studying, SPT6, was essential in yeast. And we were talking, he was a fly geneticist, and I thought, wow, wouldn't it be cool? Maybe I should um, knock out the homologous gene in flies, and that would really give me some insight to what SPT6 is doing. And he just looked at me and he said, Michelle, if you can't figure out the function of SPT6 in in yeast cells, you're not going to figure out figure it out studying flies. <laughs> so that was um, really great advice. And Mark, I appreciate it. it. It taught me early on that we can't be distracted by like c- tricks with cells or experiments that maybe just um, seem cool, but aren't going to take us deeper into mechanism. So Michelle, were you at the party where Mark Potashny brought out the Stradivarius? Um, I was not. I was not. <laughs> but he does mention that. Yeah. Um, So before I go into more detail, I'd I'd be interested to hear um, what um, each of you, if any contributions you have, were there particular moments in your own career where you recognize now um, that you had somebody advocating for you and they made a real difference or particular programs that your institutions um, are using to advance diversity? I I think it goes back sooner than that. If you look at One of the lines that he describes, uh, he says, my mom read to us from infancy and brought us to the library starting when we were old enough to walk. And I think by the time we begin recruiting, we're banking on the fact that the primary and secondary education systems have really prepared um, a diverse population from which we can select. Oftentimes, we don't have enough candidates to select 
regardless if we drop in the gender and the race card into the equation. And so it's really, I think, an investment in our communities where we have sort of nickel and dimed our primary and secondary educations, as well as our libraries out of existence in our communities for the sake of saving taxes. And well, so Michael, I agree with you that certainly a strong public school system gets us off on the right foot, but I'm going to push back a bit because there are actually lots of underrepresented minorities um, out there doing great science, and I'm going to include in the show notes um, databases in an excellent article written by our colleague, Dr. Michael Johnson from University of Arizona called A Beginner's Guide to Minority Professor hires. There are nine separate databases of scientists who are underrepresented minorities, and these are blocked under diversify microbiology, diversify immunology, chemistry, ecology, and evolutionary biologists. They include these massive spreadsheets with names, contact information, race, ethnicity, identity um, that are doing active research. So I think we need to just be more um, proactive and um, have a more representative um, slate of speakers and job candidates. And actually, ASM has put in some um, measures Mm -hmm. um, to do that, if maybe somebody else wants to comment on those. Jayla, you were going to say something before. Well, there is a built-in difficulty. Uh, We consider science to be sort of neutral, to be impersonal, to be something that's aside from societal issues because it is so pure. And when we look at it that way, we run into a barrier. And the barrier is obviously that this is ain't, this ain't the real world. The real world has a very different character. And so the, to consider the necessity for taking action outside of our sort of built-in ethos takes effort. And I think that it, it's, it's important to realize that. It, it does take effort. It is not for free. It is not. It, it runs a little bit counter what we what we grew up with, and we have to sort of take action. Well, let me so. let me um, describe another very simple um, tool that Arturo Casa Duval um, wrote about in an MBIO piece. Um, they have a study that showed that if you have a um, nominating committee that includes at least I forget what percentage is, is maybe a third of uh, women, then the speakers in those um, sessions then have more women. Mm -hmm. Um, If you have a nominating committee that is all male and white, you end up with, guess what, all white male speakers. So it's not that hard. I think each of us can be um, more conscientious and proactive, use the resources that are out there, and... um, better draw from all of the talent um, that is available. Uh, Um, Michelle, let me ask you. Sure. Do you think that we can learn something from the experience with women? There's been a a big change. Absolutely. And I'll I'll just describe a few um, examples from my own um, path. So I was a biology major in college, but I never stepped foot in a lab. I had to find a job after getting my major, and uh, fortunately, Rockefeller University came to campus to interview for technicians, and I ended up getting a technician position with Sam Silverstein at Rockefeller University, and it was my first real exposure to science. And after about a year and a half, I was I really just had fallen in love with research, but I realized there were all these conversations that were happening that were just out of my reach because I didn't have um, the background to participate. So I thought, I'll get a master's degree and then come back to the lab and work as a technician, but be able to um, compete at a higher le- or contribute at a higher level. So I, I asked um, Dr. Silverstein if he would write me a letter for a master's program. And this was in a hallway conversation, and he said no. And instead, he invited me to his office. He sat me down and he said, I want you to apply to PhD programs. And I said, oh, no, no, I don't see myself doing that. You know, I'm from the Midwest. I'm going to have a family. And he, he just wasn't hearing it. He said, you're too young to make a decision about what you're not going to do. You don't know if you're any good if you challenge yourself. 
And basically, just get the best training you can at every stage. Keep your eyes open for what excites you, what you're good at, and then decide what you're going to do. But don't tell me at your young age that you're not going to do A, B, and C. So I was I was a little embarrassed, and I just said, okay. <laughs> and I ended up applying for PhD programs, and I've had just a wonderful career. And it's because he took you know maybe 10 minutes out of his busy day as chair of a department to sit me down. So I think small gestures like that, when we see talented people in our labs, in our classrooms, and just look at them and say, you are really talented, and you're going to have a lot of options. And let me give you some advice about some programs out there. Um, I think we can all do more to diversify and make our make our field more equitable. Mark, you were going to say something. Sure. Um, I, I, I'm always, when I have these conversations, uh, and, and we have them a lot here in, in my department, I always feel a little bit off put because I'm male and I'm white. Um, but I was raised lower middle class to poor and nobody, I'm first generation like my brother and no one knew anything about science, but it was something that I was still encouraged to do even though nobody understood it. So of course those teachers in the fourth grade that had me first look at, at stuff under a microscope, um, but I think when, when I when I did a science fair project and I, I got a national award for it when I was in the eighth grade and uh, Roger Sperry at Caltech wrote me a letter and said, you should consider being a scientist. And that was the that was my magic talisman to my parents. Uh, by the way, this is not my natural way of speaking, nor is it my parents uh, rest their souls. I had to learn to speak this way when I went to college. And, and, and so those small gestures, which I try to do myself, are a really big deal. Um, I think it is a human thing to want to hire people like yourself. And that is at any level you, you care to choose. And so I've always maintained that I honor different faces and different voices. Now, part of that, obviously, is because I don't look like a typical person. <laughs> and believe me, I've heard that quite a bit. And, and it's all right because it's who I am. And so I take that with me. So I think being more introspective about your own impact on others and the contributions that you can personally make, but not patting yourself on the back. I once said to someone that I had made a big effort on behalf of someone else, and they kind of looked at me and said, what, do you want a cookie? And the truth of the matter is, when we help <laughs> others, it makes the difference. So we don't do it for the reward. We do it because it's the right thing to do. So um, Baronda Montgomery, and, and I was delighted that, that Dr. Fife, uh, Dr. Pfeiffer uh, wrote about Baronda's book, is a very helpful guide. It's, it's a book. I, I mean, I, I wish I had written something more microbial. This is lessons from plants. So we could come up with, you know, lessons from microbes. We all could do that very easily. But Baronda has many wonderful, wonderful thoughts. And, you know, I really want to get her out here talking to some of uh, my department colleagues who are very, accept very accessible to that. So I guess I'm, I'm, I don't mean to get off the topic and I don't mean to talk too much about it. I do mean to say that there are paths that we've taken where people have done things for us and we need to do those things for others, especially the people who don't look like us and think like us. And that's sometimes a challenge, but it's where, you know, the tire meets the road. And that takes us to situations of, of hiring as well. And we've made a commitment in my department to make certain that there is diversity in um, thought and, and background among our finalists or we don't have a good search. And we're having a developmental biology search this year. This is much on my mind because I'm very interested in people who think differently because that perspective brings better science. And I don't think that that's debatable. I think it's the truth. Anyway, sorry for the sermon. For sure. Yeah. No, no, no. that's that's a great contribution. And actually, it, it's an opportunity for me to um, tell people the other thing I've put in the show notes is a um, rubric developed at UCSF called the Academic Career Readiness Assessment. And it can help trainees um, look at what the expectations are for jobs at a primarily undergraduate institution versus at the other extreme, perhaps a medical um, center. Mm -hmm. And it can also um, help um, 
search committees at universities um, in their faculty hiring practices and provide more transparency in the in the hiring process. So we can be trained to um, be more um, open-minded, proactive about uh, diversifying uh, the academy. Michelle, at every step of my career, people have helped me. And I always wondered, why are they doing this? And the first time it <laughs> happened was in graduate school when I had decided to work for someone. And this other faculty member just called me into his office. He said, no, don't work for that person. They're no good. Work for this person. And I'm like, okay. So, I mean, I learned at that point that you have to learn who to listen to, but I just always wondered why would they help me? What is it for them? And obviously that's a part of the field is helping uh, other people. And throughout my career, I found that and uh, it's, it's invaluable. Yeah, just those little tips um, to let people know kind of the unwritten rules or um, guidelines. And, and actually, Mark makes that point in his piece that he um, initially was in a lab um, that was really quite quite a toxic uh, culture. And he had learned to, after that, choose labs mm. where the mentor is really interested in developing the talent and not yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, showboating. Um, Michelle, the other issue here is, of course, diversity, which in a country that is rife with systemic racism is very difficult. Like Elio said, we like to think that our profession is insulated, but it's not. And it no. can be influenced. It is, and so, peer, it is totally based on peer review. And it is just so easy to slip into what Mark described, like choosing people yeah. that are like you, that you're comfortable around. And, and I'm embarrassed to say that there's no diverse, very little diversity here where, where I am. And, you know, I have very little power or impact, but, I do have all these pods and look at the composition. I mean, you know, there, there are a bunch of women and men, which is great, but not, nothing else. And I, I I thought when we did the black and microbiology episode a while ago, that was last right. year, right, that we could uh, have more guests of color, but I just haven't done it. So I feel that I need to fix that. That's my goal. When I was president of ASV uh, in 2015, it was my goal to have half of the morning speakers women. And I did it despite many women saying I couldn't, <laughs> <laughs> I did it. And now I see every year they do that or better, which is great. And well, I think you have to do things like that. I want to stay with that for a minute because it seems to me that the experience with the number of women increasing dramatically, if you wish, in science is a lesson on how to deal mm -hmm. with other issues like this. It's an example of what can be done. Sure. It works. Sure. It does work. And I will say there are a lot more women, but um, if you look at the leadership ranks and prof um, full professors, it's, we're still lagging behind. So we're, the problem is not, has not completely gone no, away I, from women. I, but, sure. I didn't mean to say that, right, but right, it's right. getting there. It's yeah. getting I, there. I, I do want to um, uh, go back to the um, black and microbiology. I, I will include a show note, uh, a link in the show notes to what is now the Black Microbiologist Association. They too have got a lot of resources on their job board. Um, are on their uh, website, including a job board, funding opportunities, career and professional development programs um, for people. And they also have a, a link where you can um, donate to support their efforts. May I make a quick yes, comment? Mark. So one of the <laughs> things that happens a lot when you're doing a search is that uh, the best places to go to kind of encourage folks to apply. I mean, there's a, a wonderful meeting called the Annual Biomedical Research Conference for Minority Students, which I believe is pronounced Ab yes. Abracam. I can't, I'm just going to just, you know, Abracam. Abracams, all right. Yeah. But they have their meetings in November. Mm -hmm. And so we had this idea that we would send representatives out to, to kind of talk about positions that we might have available. And then the problem was, is that was so late in the hiring cycle. So I, I really approve of mm. organizations that create those kinds of opportunities um, where there's a job board where you can talk to folks. And that's really wonderful to see because sometimes it's hard to get that. And uh, so the black, black and microbiology has some wonderful stuff. If, if we were permitted to have more microbiologists, that would be a wonderful thing. So that's what we're thinking about for a developmental uh, biology hire is how best to diversify our pool. Well, um, I, I appreciate this is an important topic that we could talk for a long time on it. Um, I also know that we've got a really cool paper. So um, would anyone like to make a closing remark before we um, turn it over to um, 
main paper for today? I think this is up to us, and it's very easy for us to get wrapped up in you know our day-to-day work and ignore it, but it takes an active effort, and it's going to take time. And as you say, Michelle, even just with women, it takes a long time to get into the upper levels. For minority, it's it's going to take even longer because they're barely in the lower levels yet. And but it depends on us. Nobody else is going to do this. If we don't, who it's not will? Happen. Yeah. One of, one of the things that we have at my institution is we require every faculty member take four hours of diversity continuing education credits mm-hmm. each year. And I'm going to propose one of the items out of the show notes, maybe even starting with uh, Dr. Pfeiffer's um, uh, essay, just have folks read it and then have a discussion to offer them one hour of their diversity credit uh, as part of a faculty meeting so that we can talk about diversity issues. So then when we begin to do a search, and open the search, we at least have thought about this issue of privilege and diversity and how best to accomplish our goal, which is a more diverse faculty that looks like the populations that we are serving. Well said. All right. Thank you, Michelle. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Uh, Now uh, we shall engage our guest who is going to talk all about Borgs. Well, thank you very much. And, uh, Even though I said I would try not to talk too much, here I go again. And uh, this was something that is currently uh, uh, up on the archives, bioarchives, that is currently being discussed. And it comes out of the laboratory of Jill Banfield at Berkeley. Uh, But we have 11 authors, and I really want to to kind of show uh, special attention to Basim el Shab. And I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I reveal my background at my inability to do things like that. No disrespects intended. I look at so many names on here, including the very famous Jennifer Dodna. And so when you look at al Shayab and, 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 and all the rest here, they're at Berkeley. And the title of this, of this particular paper is Borgs are giant extra chromosomal elements with the potential to augment methane oxidation. And I would like to make a couple of comments first, because I discover some folks don't know who the Borg are. And I actually saw some funny <laughs> stuff about that. And the first thing that I want to tell you, it comes from the Star Trek fictional universe and Dr. Banfield's son named these elements And by the way, you never call someone who likes Star Trek a Trekkie, as one of the review articles did. They are Trekkers. I say this to (laughs) to keep you out of trouble if you run into such people. I learned this the hard way. And the Borg are cybernetic. Well, they're cyborgs is what they are. And their whole resistance is futile. You will be assimilated. And so they travel the galaxy incorporating other forms of organic and mechanical life into them. And this fits very well into the take-home lesson for this. Would also like to point out, especially when I look at what is essentially an in silico paper, where you're just looking at uh, sequence data per se, I adore it when there are editorials and summaries. And in fact, uh, Nature, Nature did one of them. I put up a link to the one in science and even a web magazine called Quanta. Um, Mark, before you go on, I want to give a shout out to Elliot Smith. He is the bioinformatics librarian at UC Berkeley, and it, um, he is the one that coined um, this term. So they have a librarian who's a specialist in molecular cell biology, genetics, genomics, immunology, uh-huh. comparative biochemistry, et cetera, et cetera. And um, he was acknowledged as the uh, brilliant person who came up with the term Borg. <laughs> now, you must understand that when I have my notes up in front of me, I can't see you very well, so do interrupt it at, at will. Please do. Anyway, it's very useful when you do uh, when you teach a, a, a paper like this to have those kinds of reviews. It works really well with students. And the first thing that I want to remind all the listeners of is that the late, great Carl Woese had this idea that many people didn't respect, but it really stuck with me, the idea that there was a non-Darwinian part of evolution where all organisms were exchanging genetic information. And that always struck me because I've been so taken by horizontal gene transfer among the microbial for so long that this really appealed to me. And I have to say that I knew what would happen as soon as this paper appeared. 
And this is a little bit of a joke, but there's truth in it. Um, there are three stages to scientific uh, discovery. The first is that's a silly idea. You're not bright for suggesting it. <laughs> the second level or second stage is well, that might work in the lab, but it's not the relevant, not relevant to the natural world. And the third is, uh, I said it was a good idea all along. <laughs> and a former student of mine who's a wonderful physician in Southern California, when she was in my lab, Micheline Wong was her name, uh, she actually added a fourth level, and I came up with the idea first. And we've all seen this. Mm -hmm. So- I fully expect to watch these sorts of things happen with what's being discussed here. Also, whenever I teach microbiology, as I will in just a few weeks, I often show a, a textbook a photograph, which is really relevant to this paper, though it is about bacteria, showing enormous genomic islands with different G plus C values and all kinds of common functionality to them. And this showed me that something other than transformation, transduction, conjugation, or even these newfangled vesicles, uh, are there are elements of, of, of horizontal gene transfer that involve very large pieces of DNA. And that also wasn't a surprise because when I was in graduate school, I used to work on cyanorhizobium melalodi, and there were two very large plasmids, that is to say 1.2 and 1.4 megabases, the gene I studied in graduate school, dicarboxylate transport, was on one of them and thiamine biosynthesis on the other. So I guess what I'm trying to come to is this idea that we could easily see this constant exchange of genetic information taking place all the time. And how does that work? We're used to the idea of our plasmids picking up many um, transposable elements. So this idea of a modular horizontal gene transfer this may be good evidence for it. And it brings, because we only see horizontal gene transfer when we know what we're looking for. The paper itself, which I really enjoyed, and not simply because it's short in length, uh, has a wealth <laughs> of extra information. It has, I mean, there's everything there to satisfy whoever you are. I was very taken by it. At first, I thought this is a very long paper, but in fact, most of it is taken up with all the figures and supplemental materials, but they're organized in a way that I found very easy to understand. And knowing the work of Dr. Banfield as I do, I thought this would involve anaerobic methane oxidation, and indeed it does. So the idea was in this paper that they were trying to study what sorts of um, genes they could find involved with this. So they did that thing that's very common now where you take total DNA from an environment, in this case, subsurface, anaerobic, isolate total DNA, sequence, and analyze. And in the process of this analysis, they found large linear pieces of DNA up to, and they predict larger, and so do I, of one megabase, and they're packed with genes. They also appeared to have inverted repeats. Mark, at the, where did they look for this and does that matter? Well, that's where I'm coming to. They looked first in some of the sites that have been looked at okay. in the past. And the claim is made in one of the review papers. This is Dr. Manfield's yard, but I don't believe that. It's some of the places where they've looked for them. And this is in the Berkeley area. But I'm, I'm thinking you're going to see this wherever you see anaerobic ammonia oxidation. Um, and again, among and actually, the and, and I, I know that there is an um, aquifer uh, near Rifle, Colorado, and that's Rifle, where they Colorado. discovered the Borgs. Yes, yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. And find and, and them by the way, to give you a sense for what's involved, they um, pumped four hundred to twelve hundred liters of groundwater from each of these sites through a custom built uh, filtration apparatus to recover the biomass um, mm. that they then did deep sequencing on to discover these Borgs. Wow. So this is uh, not for the faint of heart. No, you really had to go after this in a big way in order to do this. And and I think anytime you look in the subsurface or deep subsurface, we're going to find all sorts of uh, unique microbial signatures like Mark's going to continue and tell us about. Yeah, and I really appreciate the additional information there. So I want to thank you for it. I get excited about this kind of stuff. As as Michelle was talking about it, I was imagining what the filters looked like. 
after they ran, you know, hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of gallons of effluent through it. And, and that would have been yeah. my job is scraping those. I'm quite sure. But, um, again, they found these large pieces of DNA that were connected to one another. They, they didn't appear to be pieces. And once again, this is why we need to make the sign of the double helix for the computer scientists that have enabled us to kind of stitch those pieces together from the relatively short reads that we get through high throughput sequencing. And they appear to be in one piece and packed with genes, inverted repeats at the termini, and what appear to be two replicative origins. And as I read this, I thought these sound like great big linear chromosomes like you see among the actinobacteria. And that might be true. Or it could be a new virus. And I bring that up because what they say there, and I am not an expert in archaeal viruses, um, there haven't been a lot of reports of large genome sizes among archaeal viruses. And by the way, I once called them bacteriophages and got somebody irritable with me. So I will call those, you know, Ooh. archaeal viruses. So as we don't know, even though it's bacteria, how genomic islands occur, I do think that this kind of idea of a shuttle uh, that can carry pieces of DNA around is very interesting. The field and of Mark, extra- if I could interrupt, please. They, had, they have a terrific sentence in their conclusions that says, we can neither prove that they are <laughs> archaeal viruses or plasmids or mini chromosomes, nor can we prove that they are not. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. No, Which is probably it's- why it's still a preprint. Well, no, I, I mean, they're making it clear that they're speculating. And I, yeah. I think that's it's absolutely right to put that at the end of a paper. You wouldn't want yes. to see that in results. But yeah, I, I <laughs> really appreciated that. There oh, no, I, 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 I do, too, because it would be very easy to, to have a personal feeling about this work and to really carry that football downfield to spike it in the end zone. But they don't have enough data to do that because this is new. And, and I found it very interesting. They found basically 23 sequences that they refer to as, I'm going to call them Borgish, and they name them after colors. And and I really, really like that. Um, uh, The Borgs that they were discussing are associated with methanoparidins, which is an archaeon that is not yet culturable. Now, this makes me wonder, and this is something that I, I ponder a lot about, and since I'm getting too excited. I'm going to see if anyone wants to contribute something in a moment. But I I often worry that when you look for a particular environment, you're biasing what's there. So I'm very, I want to know how general Borgs are. And I am guessing they're extremely general. And if you're looking at places that are rife with anaerobic ammonia oxidation, you're going to see those kinds of modules for anaerobic uh, methane oxidation there. What do you folks think? I yes, think you're Mark. absolutely right. Why hasn't this been found elsewhere? Yeah. I think not everybody has got the ability to um, sample hundreds of liters and um, filter right. it and then be able to get the genome sequencing out yeah. of that sample. I'm, I'm reminded of an experiment that Howard Guest and Bill Shop. Uh, Bill Schaff is a paleogeologist, and Howard um, Guest worked out the Z-scheme of bacterial photosynthesis once upon a time. And they did a very similar experiment back in the 80s when they were working on stromatolites, microbial fossils, and they filtered large volumes of seawater. And Bill at the time was characterizing microbes based on the ability of microbes to fractionate isotopes. Because when they were looking at the paleofossils, the microbial paleofossils, they had different isotopic ratios of sulfur. And it was in the early days of mass spectroscopy where they were looking at the masses of sulfur in these rocks. And so I'm wondering is if they still had these water samples or sediments that they had collected, you know, 35 years ago, whether or not today with our technology, we could go back 
and begin to piece these things together. I think what we will learn in another 20 years is that a lot of this stuff has been rediscovered as our tools get better. And this is really a paper that highlights our ability to infer. And that's really the take-home message from this paper is that, as Mark said in the beginning, horizontal gene transfer enables microbes to dabble in evolution without it costing them their lives. They're able to say, will this give me a selective advantage to outcompete my neighbor or will by carrying this 1.2 megabases with me, will I die simply because times will get tough in the future? And, you know, the, the fact that this is methane oxidation and methane being the universal dumping ground of waste electrons, because for anaerobes, their challenge is where to dump their trash. And for anaerobes, electrons are trash. And if you have the ability to grab a mole of CO2 and dump all your waste electrons into CO2, you make methane. And then some opportunist that has this 1.2 megabases of DNA can say, lunch, and effectively metabolize by methane oxidation. So we're seeing the yin and yang of horizontal gene transfer literally advancing evolution without potentially an evolutionary cost. Mark, uh, is this uh, thought to be inside of some cell and, and that's what they filtered through all these hundreds of liters of water? Or is it floating around extracellular? Do we know? Well, they're thinking they're, in, they're inside cells because they're not seeing gene, genes mm -hmm. that are associated with the equivalent of capsids or things of that nature. But it's important to note that in some samples that were very rich with, um, I've got to say it correctly, methanoparetidins, uh, they didn't see these Borgs in some of them. And by the way, uh, they, uh, when they say that the Borg names are just colors, they also were calling some of them sky, which I just love that idea a lot. But it's fascinating that a lot of the genes that they're finding yeah. in these – go ahead. I was going to say to, to amplify uh, Michael's point, um, some – gosh, has it been 15 or 20 years ago? Um, the pathogenesis field was excited oh, about yeah. pathogenicity islands um, that could confer all new traits and allow expansion of a microbe into a new niche. And, and this is a parallel, um, but now these are um, increasing their metabolic options. Very I cool. remember having breakfast one morning at a Gordon conference with Stanley Falco, who was literally apoplectic over pathogenicity islands and talking about IS elements. And he said, you just need a good sequence and you look for the IS elements and we can find the IS element word and we just hunt and then bang, we get a pathogenicity island. It's got a different GC and Stanley was just so animated and that was at the Gordon Conference for Undergraduate Teaching Excellence that cool. ASM ran in 1999. And Stanley was one of the keynote speakers. And he just energized the audience by introducing the notion of pathogenicity islands in 1999 to this group that went out and now has trained, if you think about it, 20 years is a generation of scientists that were effectively evangelized by Stan Falco hmm. talking about the potential of what we're seeing today in this paper, where you're doing a deep dive on sequencing, literally a deep dive, <laughs> and you're discovering these beautiful extra chromosomal elements that have all of these physiology genes. And one of the figures in this paper, if you don't do anything, just look at the, the metabolic figure diagram that they show and which one is it numbered? It may be figure two or three. Uh, but that, that metabolism figure where they're showing you how stuff works 
And what the molecular geneticists will freak out about is it's got CRISPR. Yeah. Yeah. Another CRISPR's in there. Yep. yep. I yep. mean, who knew? Myth- Archaea and CRISPRs. Yeah. Which is, um, you can think of it as a, as a um, microbial defense mechanism to guard against um, incoming the DNA. Incoming to guard against material. the Borg. Protect your genome. Yep. One of the things that we're not dealing with too much is that the amazing thing about the Borgs is that extra cellular. The, the strings that are outside the cells. That is, I think, amazing. You would are think they? that DNA is very labile. Lots of DNA aces around. So extracellular DNA doesn't last very long. Ah! I don't know. Is yeah, it extracellular? That's different. the question. My Elio, I don't know if it's extracellular. That's the question. How do you know? They didn't see if it was cell associated. They just took the filtrate, right? They had Mark scrape off the filters and uh, yeah. extract it, right? <laughs> Yeah. Well, in the in the uh, paper by uh, who, who is it? The, the the other paper, Amber Dance. They show pictures of extracellular DNA. I don't know. I'm not sure. No. I know where they got it from. Oh, you're the talking nature about paper you're referring nature to. Paper. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I as 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 I say, this is just you know a really interesting idea. And what occurs to me. Because when you talk about pathogenicity islands that I always teach as genomic islands, because you can find citrate utilization uh, on such an element in E. coli, you can find uh, in, in, in mesorhizobium lodi, you'll find a whole slew of symbiosis genes. And so it, to me, suggests that there's this modular approach to things. Now, if there are so many microbes out there and they're all doing this, Maybe that's just the way that the hand was dealt during that particular situation, and then there was an advantage to those. But it does bring up an interesting question, which is why would you maintain that much DNA, which there has to be a cost to? And it's easy for me to say that we really don't understand um, you know, fitness, which is a terrible thing to say. Right. But I wonder if we really understand what costs are from a microbial perspective, because um, how else would you maintain this much DNA if you didn't need it? You know, uh, on these on these on these by definition, it must be conferring fitness. Right. And and that always worried me with the megaplasmids in graduate school. The same thing. So if I could um, share some um, background. So the first author, um, Bassem al Shayib, is a graduate student, um, as Mark mentioned, in the lab of Jill Banfield, and also a co-mentor is Jennifer Dwadna, and he's also an NSF predoctoral fellow at UC Berkeley. He grew up in Egypt and was um, fortunate that his school had a couple of microscopes, and he would spend time after school looking at all their slides, taking pictures with his cell phone, and then Googling the images and to learn about the organelles and their functions. So he was just awed by all this. In, during the Arab Spring, which was about 10 years ago, um, that was a time of uprising, uh, pro-democracy protests, etc. Um, he emigrated to uh, the U.S. with the goal of, of improving medical access and health services in his, his community. But um, as an undergraduate it, at University of Minnesota, he um, worked with Jeff Gralnick, um, who at the time was studying microbial fuel cells and their ability to transport electrons using extracellular appendages. So that got him really excited about microbiology and also synthetic biology and realized that he could um, use those tools to, um, to help society, to advance um, public health, et cetera, and environmental health. So um, as an undergraduate, he worked with a team that developed methods for bioremediation of toxic methylmercury from water sources using synthetic biology, and their team won the Best Environment Project Award and a gold medal at the 2014 International Genetically Engineered Machine Competition. Wow. So he realized then that he wanted to do this for the rest of his life. Um, So after he got his bachelor's um, in microbiology, genetics, cell biology, and development, he got a fellowship to study um, at NASA, a space life sciences fellowship, to study how spaceflight conditions could impact the physiology of future generations. 
And that was with April Ronka. So after that, um, he was um, really excited to begin graduate work um, with Dr. Uh, Banfield and uh, continues to study um, or to apply metagenomics and biochemistry and develop biotechnological applications. And in particular, uh, more recently during the COVID pandemic, he worked with a team to develop a pop-up wastewater testing lab that can be used for um, surveillance of wastewater um, looking for um, SARS-CoV-2 viral genomic material in the San Francisco Bay. And they have published this work in a series of um, papers in MBIO, in environmental science and technology, and water research that allows people um, in low-resource communities um, to actually um, use this um, screening to better understand the dynamics of the pandemic in that area. So in addition to his um, amazing research that we heard about today, he also um, gives back to the community in a number of ways. He leads interactive presentations about science and ethics of gene editing technology um, that we can now do easily um, through the CRISPR-Cas technology that we mentioned. So he does this in middle schools and high schools. And he's also an editor of the Magal Elmi Social Initiative, which translates the latest scientific findings into Arabic. And on social media, they have tens of thousands of followers, and their goal is to improve the accessibility of science and to inspire Arab youths to pursue um, careers in research. So um, he is quite a um, uh, accomplished um, scientist. We're fortunate to have him. Um, he does say that what he really loves about his current research is um, is these field trips. He says we never know what we're going to find when we're hunting for cool new microbes, and he also loves the just puzzle solving um, ability. He said with these Borgs, he's been scratching his head for many months trying to decipher what these Borgs are and, you know, eliminating possibilities one by one to try to narrow in um, what they might be. And when he's not doing that fascinating work, he enjoys hiking, swimming, art, and photography. He also is a longtime fan of um, the TWIM podcast and also the um, Small Things Considered blog. So he was quite excited um, to hear that we were going to feature his uh, thesis work. It's nice to hear. <laughs> yeah. So, Mark, let me ask you this question. Have you read Andy Weir's fiction book called Hail Mary? Yes. It's a microbial course. adventure in, in <laughs> outer space. Do you think that if, if Weir could revise his manuscript, would he have put the Borg into it? Or do you think Paramount would have come down on him and not used the term? Yeah. It, that, that's what it really is. It's it's like fights between lawyers. Um, that that's the yes. whole situation. <laughs> um, but I, I tell you that all Andy Weir had to do is call me on the phone and say, "Mark, let's have dinner," yeah. and then I, I and I could have come up with some wonderful microbes for him. But this has happened over and over again. Um, and I do want to say that many years ago, a friend of mine wrote a wonderful book called "Heart of the Comet." This is Gregory Benford with David Brin. And in order to deal with the methane that you're going to have when you have when you are on Halley's Comet, essentially subsurface, they created symbionts that clean that up. And the first time I met Greg, I sat next to him and I said, "Did you base that on some scientific research?" And he took a sip of his drink, leaned over, and said, "We made it up." And that <laughs> happens a lot <laughs> oh. with, with with science fiction. But no, I, I, I mean, I, I love that kind of stuff. And can, can, I, can I say that I was really happy to hear Michelle talk about Bassem al uh attitudes because I follow him a little bit on Twitter and the way that he has been quoted in writing, he really enjoys what he's doing. And, and yes, he does all kinds of wonderful service, but the important thing is he's got that love of it. I can almost see like the, the grin on his face from it. And I, and I really appreciate an opportunity to talk about this. I think that, like Ford Doolittle would say, I think there's this constant flow of information all the time. And I think they're onto something that may be of general application. But there are some people to take back to the beginning who will say, oh, this is just what we expected. And I'm, I'm not sure about that because data don't lie. Though they sometimes it does feel that way. So I really appreciate keep looking and finding more data and, and really loving it. And finally, we need an E. coli of the archaea because it's so hard to do some of this work. 
And I, I really love that they're thinking about application. How, how can we take this knowledge and apply it to uh, mitigate the damage that uh, methane yeah. does to our environment? Yeah, just One to gigaton emph- globally each year. Right. And, and just to emphasize, 30 to 50 times of the uh, warming capacity of CO2. And there is a lot of it out there. Mark, it's great to have you. Thank you for sharing that fascinating paper. Hey, Mark, I have to ask you a question. What's the object... What's that object to your right, red red object sitting on a stool? That is a giant plush tardigrade. Yeah, sure. I'll bring it over. You mean this? Tardigrade. <laughs> yes. This is larger than some oh, of my funny. students. He's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> That's something. That's really but something. tardigrades don't have eyes, do they? Yeah, sure they do. Tardigrades don't have eyes. They do? Yeah. Look, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna send you the I'm gonna send you the tardigrade stare off picture I took. Okay, they have well they're photoreceptors. Okay, it's like okay. saying planarians have eyes, right? Elio, you were saying something else. I was gonna say if they didn't have eyes, how can they look at you? <laughs> <laughs> Looking up, saying why is that cover slip there? Right? Mark, I have one question. <laughs> Certainly. What's next with this? Oh, with this with this work. I tell you, now that they kind of know what to go about, admittedly, and I want to thank Michelle again for talking about the, you should take the 500 miles and turn it to 5,000 gallons and said that song, I will walk 500 wild miles. Yeah. <laughs> I will filter 10,000 gallons. That should be the new song. Um, once they know kind of what to look for, I would predict they'll find things like this and, you know, enriched on whatever these elements are for whatever environment you're talking about. I know that there are things like, and I hate to keep coming back to genomic islands, but I do think that's that's relevant. I mean, they look like genomic islands in bacteria, um, but there are many more genes in these. And it could be this may be specific to archaea, and that's fine because we don't know so much about them, do we? But I would predict, like, if you were to look at archaea from very, t- well, in fact, you do. You find telluride resistance in, in some of these, don't you? So um, I would predict if you went to toxic right. waste areas, you, you would find them. So I think that's what ne- mm-hmm. that's what's next. And, and it may be that there's this constant convection of genetic information. And, you know, what, what's the old uh, bass pecking thing about about uh, microbial ecology that everything is everywhere and the environment selects? Maybe, Absolutely. Maybe, maybe that applies to genes. And I want to give a shout out to the U.S. Department of Energy that's funding this work and also the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub and Innovative Genome Institute. Um, it might sound like really weird science, but um, we can come up with wonderful applications. Yeah. Hmm. All right, Mark. It's lovely. Good Thank for our so side. Much. Very nice. Thank you so much. Right, that is um, TWIM248. The show notes are at microbe.tv slash TWIM. You can send your questions to twim at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. Our guest today from the University of Puget Sound, Mark O. Martin. Thank you, Mark. Um, thank you. It's good to have you. Come back again, okay? Whenever you'd like. This All is right. Fun. Love to hear it. Alio Schechter's at Small Things Considered. Thank you, Alio. My pleasure. Michelle Swanson's at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Michelle. My pleasure. Good to see you all. Michael Schmitz at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone. Enjoyed it. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIM was edited by Ray Ortega. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.